The age of Jackson ushered in a new period of democratization, political parties, and policies that had far-reaching ramifications. But what did the Jackson presidency actually look like? Let's start and take a look at the 1824 elections. Andrew Jackson, a lawyer and decorated military leader from Tennessee, had just lost against John Quincy Adams in the presidential election of 1824. I didn't lose. I won both the popular and electoral votes. It was a corrupt bargain, and I stand by that. I don't have any idea what you're talking about. Everything was on the up and up. As there was no outright winner, the House of Representatives voted in favor of John Quincy Adams thanks to Speaker Henry Clay. It so turned out that Adams named Henry Clay as his Secretary of State in March of 1825. A bit suspicious, huh? But Jackson shook off the loss, and by the time the 1828 election was held, Jackson's popularity had soared partly thanks to new voting laws. In 1828, Jackson's support had swelled throughout the country thanks to many states expanding the voting rights to all white men, not just to property owners. It was a bitter campaign. But what do you expect with Adams and his posse of elitists? They went so far as to charge my wife of bigamy. Outrageous! In the end, Jackson defeated John Quincy Adams with 54% of the popular vote and securing 178 of the 261 electoral votes. Power to the people. Instead of putting together a traditional cabinet, I formed an informal group of advisors and friends to help lead my administration. Jackson was inaugurated on March 4, 1829. He took office at a rare time when there were no major economic or foreign crises facing the United States. Jackson didn't waste time turning power over to the common people, as he had promised in his campaign. I first focused on my presidential appointments. I believed that a rotation of public officials was the most democratic process, and therefore I removed and replaced a large number of people who had been running the government. Jackson's appointments were just a corrupt use of political patronage. Jackson's spoil system and empowerment of the common man were key points in what would be called Jacksonian democracy. The beginning of Jackson's presidency was marked by a crisis that would have implications for many years to come. Before Jackson became president, Congress passed the Tariff of 1828. The high tariffs on imported goods were devised to protect mostly the northeastern manufacturers who complained about competition from English imports. Before I even stepped into the White House, this was a mess. The South and South Carolina took particular issue with the tariff. These tariffs hurt the good people of South Carolina and the South because not only were we paying higher prices on imported goods, but our crucial trade with England significantly suffered. I encourage the states to stop this nonsense and ignore these laws. Supporters hoped that Jackson would reduce or even get rid of the tariffs altogether. As a firm believer in states' rights, I understood where South Carolina was coming from, but we had a huge national debt, and the tariff was a way to help repay it. The tariff issue would be one that simmered throughout much of Jackson's first term, with Jackson and South Carolina both refusing to compromise. This would come to a head in 1832. The 1828 tariff greatly increased tensions between northern and southern states for decades to come. One of the most controversial bills passed under Jackson's administration was the Indian Removal Act of 1830. Five indigenous tribes were located on land that was highly sought after by white settlers. The bill set aside land in the West for native tribes to be relocated and resettled on. The bill was illegal, so we took it to court. The Cherokees of Georgia sued the federal government in a case that went all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled in the Cherokees' favor, but Georgia continued to refuse to enforce it on the basis of states' rights. Jackson, who would later take a much different stance on states' rights in South Carolina, famously said of the case, John Marshall has made his decision. Now let him enforce it. It's one of my most memorable quotes. Over 15,000 of the Cherokees were forced to walk from their homes in the southern states to a designated territory in present-day Oklahoma in 1838, and this became known as the Trail of Tears. Despite the issues that plagued his first term, Jackson ran for re-election with Martin Van Buren as his running mate. Jackson's opponent was Henry Clay, the former Speaker of the House and former Secretary of State. We called him King Andrew I because of his excessive use of the veto and, of course, his corrupt spoils system. 
Going into re-election, I focused on the abolition of the Second National Bank, a platform popular among the people. The people viewed the bank as only serving the interests of the Northeastern elites. Jackson was re-elected in 1832 with the majority of the popular vote and 219 out of 286 electoral votes. I was down but not out after the election defeat. Much of my first term was marred by the tariff issue. South Carolina believed I did nothing to appease them, though I did support the idea of rewriting the tariff to reduce the burden. After several years of simmering tensions in hopes of appeasing the South, Congress passed a revised tariff in 1832 that lessened the burden on the Southerners. Trust me, Jackson's inflexibility to compromise on the tariff issue was the main reason I resigned as Vice President in December of 1832. We weren't appeased, instead we declared the tariff null and void. I didn't like that at all, so I denounced the nullification and asked Congress to pass a bill to authorize the use of federal troops to enforce federal laws. Luckily, the force bill was never enforced. The reduced tariff bill was passed in 1833 and it satisfied both South Carolina and Jackson. As promised in my re-election, I made the abolition of the second bank a primary goal of my second term. The bank's charter was due to expire in 1836, but in 1832, I vetoed a bill that would have extended its charter. Jackson believed that the bank was a symbol of elitism and big business. Within months of my second inauguration, I ordered the removal of federal deposits from the second bank. Jackson had the deposits placed in what the opposition called pet banks. I even managed to pay off the national debt for the first and only time in U.S. history. At the time, as a popular move to close the second bank, Jackson's popularity continued to grow throughout his presidency. The good times of Jackson's economy, however, would not be long-lasting as the abolishment of the second bank would eventually lead to the Panic of 1837. Though, in hindsight, the economy boom was mostly caused by the banks printing more money and allowing paper money sales of land. Jackson issued the executive order, Specie Circular, which ended the practice of selling government land on credit. This meant that all land purchase had to be done with either gold or silver. Jackson tried to rectify this on his last day in office, but the result was an economic crisis in 1837. Ironically, I'm now on that paper money myself. The age of Jackson has had long-lasting influence on American politics today. His use of expansive presidential powers and vetoes, his reconfiguring of political parties, his wide use of the spoil system, and his support of the Indian Removal Act, Jackson was definitely a polarizing president. <laughs>